Thank you. Uh, what a flattering introduction that was. I left out a few Pre things out of my CV Pre there, but... Pre <laughs> <laughs> but of course, manifest modesty precludes me elaborating in detail. Uh, I don't know whether a lot of you know, but uh, I'm a political animal. I am the right of Genghis Khan. I don't know whether that might be a bit brutal and a bit truculent for a lot of you in this room. But I have a clear vision for the country, and I've listened very intently to both Mr Drury, uh, one of my pet hates, of course, his uh, preferences. And then I listen intently to fiscal policy, which is one of the few professors, where are you, Sinclair? Which I've enjoyed immensely. It was a wonderful Shakespearean sonnet over 14 lines and a pricey that I actually understood on fiscal policy. <laughs> and why this hasn't been incorporated for some time, I've got no idea. Now, I pay my fair share of tax, and I'm very proud to pay it because I'm a very high achiever. And I make no qualms about that. But may I just digress with your permission for a moment? Fiscal policy is imperative. We talk about the, uh, the structure and the, uh, the topography of the landscape of which we live, which we all know has changed dramatically over the years. At a time where we multiplied our possessions and reduced our values. We've got bigger homes, we've got smaller families. we build built broader freeways, we've got narrower views. we build more computers to download more information, yet we communicate less and less. We have difficulty crossing the street to talk to a neighbour. And I look at this microcosm of wealth and influence and this convocation of scholastic talent that's prevalent in this room. <laughs> Apart from that Christian... What's that Christian group? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get to you a little bit later on, mate. <laughs> but it's amazing how much in the short space of two decades. And, you know, you look at the wisdom that's prevalent in this room. Who would have thought that, as we speak, that the best golf in the world would be black? The best rap dancer would be white. <laughs> the Swiss would have held the America's Cup. The French would accuse the Americans of being arrogant. <laughs> and the Germans would refuse to go to war. <laughs> but see, that's all happened in the short space of two decades. Well, you may laugh, but it has. That is fact. Without a doubt, you're gonna, you can't argue. Well, let me just digress another, often a tangent, if I may. I've just celebrated my 20th wedding anniversary. Thank you for the animated response. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be implicitly candid with you. I've had a couple of cracks of reaching that lofty landmark. <laughs> In fact, I ran to my first wife last week and I forgot her name. <laughs> and I remembered it was plaintive. But anyway... <laughs> but some of you would understand you're really tempting fate when you ask your partner of two decades how would you like to celebrate 20 years of sheer bliss? Now, without being disparaging to a lot of you in this room, very few of you will ever get the opportunity of trekking the rarefied orbit that I trek in. Most of you are going to be hovering around base camp and that's where you're going to be staying all your lives. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that. But you'll know with these dark fiscal clouds that if we had let the believers, the way they disseminate information in this country, that they're really hanging around. Well, you're really tempting fate when you ask your partner how would you like to celebrate because you really test your resource with a depth of resource. But in my case, I'm very lucky, I've got a very frugal partner. And when I posed the question, she said, you know what, Sam, I'd like to go back where it all started 20 years ago. So I picked up the phone and I booked a suite at the Hilton Hotel. And we had a wonderful candle-lit dinner. Then we adjourned back to our suite that night. Now, most of you in this room will know what a superstar I've been the fields of battle of this wonderful nation. <laughs> But what a lot of you don't know is just how anatomically gifted I am to be able to perform equally as adequately late at night. <laughs> and despite the fact that my partner had put on a few extra kilos over a 20 year period, and the fact that I burnt my ass in the ceiling light, I still performed fairly admirably. And in the morning, as I did 20 years earlier, I ordered breakfast, sat in the balcony, and proceeded to. digest a liberal splash of bacon and eggs. When at that precise moment in time, she intervened and said, Sam. And I said, what? She said, you're obviously having a senior's moment. And I said, why is that? She said, well, if you recall 20 years ago, we sat in this very balcony, but we sat here totally unclad. I looked at her fair and square in the eye and I said, well, if you're game enough, so am I. So we both disrobed. <laughs> and we sat there in the nude, proceeded to have our breakfast. Five minutes had elapsed, and she said, Sam. And I said, what? <laughs> she said, I just want to let you know that my nipples are as warm for you now as they were 20 years ago. 
So I cogitated, or just pondered for a moment, and I said, so they ought to be. I said, one's in your porridge and the other's in your coffee. <laughs> so what's the relevance of all that about a political party? Well, I'm going to tell you. I may not be a full book, as Sinclair is, on fiscal policy, and Mr Dreary is on his insidious, surreptitious formation of a political party, <laughs> with the greatest degree of respect, I might add. <laughs> Joe Melky Peterson and Jerry Manders went out the back door a long time ago. <laughs> you know, we're not going to all of a sudden turn a freeway through a bottle shop. <laughs> I think you all know what I'm alluding to. But I will tell you how you can win. The lamb industry, seven years ago, some of you may understand the rural sector, were culling our sheep and putting them in the ground for a buck a head. Yep. That's right. You could go to a butcher shop and he'd give you a box of lamb shanks for 50 cents to give to your dog. My wife went to Brand Central and bought six lamb shanks the other day and paid $43.95 for them. And then rang me up and told me to stick my head up my ass. <laughs> you may laugh. Now here lies the great paradox. Because I'm going to tell you one thing. Now Mr. Drury, this country is primed. And Sinclair touched on it briefly, he could have probably extrapolated a little bit more. The time of spin Platitudes, slogans, deviousness, deception and guile are rooted. Yep. Dispense with it. Because the public out there, the constituency, are ready for someone to stand up and say it as it is. And despite the fact that what I do and peddle on TV, the land industry is a wonderful product. We have got a fantastic product. But one of the key facts in the manner in which it's presented in, an irre in a very irreverent, satirical, Australian manner. Thank God we had the vision a couple of years ago or 18 months ago to get rid of that obsequious, sycophantic sybarite who ran our country, who we overdosed on tolerance and immersed ourselves in political correctness, yeah. which has sent us back 100 years. Yeah. The only thing we've done smart in this country was releasing David Hicks from Gwilt from Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. And then what we do, we set him to Adelaide as though the poor bus had to <laughs> But I'm telling you, I travel the length and width of this country. Now, people don't gravitate and I don't, believe, I don't gain traction because I'm Sam Kekovich, but they do believe in what I say. Now, Sam Kekovich, as you know, the derivative of the surname Kekovich is not Anglo-Saxon. It's got a European connotation that lends itself to a tinge of slander. And I grew up in this wonderful country in the 50s. I was born in Manjot, Western Australia. A very proud Australian. Came with parents from war-torn Europe. Didn't come here off their own volition. Were forced migrants because they opposed communism and Hitlerism. But when they got here, let me tell you the difference between the country of Australia then and the nation we are now. When they got here, we had distinct leadership. They came here and they were showing away the other, we went to Bonagilla, but we also were sponsored, we grew tobacco. And my father assimilated, became a leader of the community, uh, learnt the language, was one of the Dagos and the Wogs of the time to hang over a drip train and said, it's your shout, mate, and became a part of Australian folklore. But they accepted and they rolled up their sleeves and became a part of the truly new Australia because they were committed to it. It's cosmopolitan. I argue with my good friend Simon Crean, who we're ideologically poles apart, but we're great mates, through another common fabric that we share at the North Melbourne Football Club, who was the number one ticket holder, and a great man, I might add. Got a great vision, but like all those soft cock... Uh, <laughs> you know, got that wonderful terminology in the lexicon called inclusion, and, you know, let's hug and all that bullshit. But anyhow... <laughs> But, you know, what we've allowed to fester under the, the guise of multiculturalism is these acrimonious pockets of dissent that don't assimilate, that don't learn our language, because we have allowed to assimilate, 
that don't learn our language because we have allowed a mentality of welfare and distribution. Yeah. Now, everything that I've heard here today so far is so relevant. But let me tell you, you might as well jump out that window if you think you can change it by just rubber stamping what you've heard here today. Because the only way to change, you've got to change philosophically. And it's got to change from the ground up. And by that I mean people out there are ready. They want to reclaim their egalitarian values. You know, I got raised in an era where I came and built a billy cart and came down the side of a hill at 100 miles an hour and got a few abrasions, picked myself up and mum told me to move on and get back up the hill. Six mouths drank out of the same glass out of the same bottle. You think anything happened to us? <laughs> Nothing. But now, of course... We've got these, as I said, obsequious sycophants and killjoys that want to layer, they have layer upon layer of layer of bylaws. And you know why we breathe them? And you know why we've got a pathetic gap? You know, we had a front bench here that's never held, never held, and this is reprehensible, never held a directorship in a company and never run a company. They all had a card, the entire front bench of the Labor Party. And there they are trying to devise fiscal policy and run a trillion dollar empire. It is just... And you wonder why pink bats and we've got, you know, hot water services running around down the Murray River. We've got a million of them. And people are getting electrocuted. Uh, why would we be addled? That's what we, that's what we, that's what we deserve. Yep. But that should be exposed. Let me tell you, I grew in the era when Australia was a great country. Not this nation of Mrs. Justice that are appearing over people's backyard fences. You know, we used to jump in the trenches over the parapet, draw a bone to charge the enemy down and, sat, and say it as it is, and kick the shit out of them. <laughs> and then we got beat and we take your sister away on a footy trip. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> but let me tell you, remember, remember the days, and girls, you'll love this, I've done it. I got raised in an era where sex was safe and parachuting was dangerous. <laughs> a wedgie was a shoe and a shag was a haircut. You know, prostate meant lying on the floor pissed. <laughs> Pussy was a cat. You know, metrosexual meant having a root in the tram away from training. <laughs> but we used to say it the way it was. And I'm telling you now, I travel this country the length and width of it. You know, with the, uh, the real salt of the earth people. Not only the rural sector. But even the people, you see the frustration in their faces. You know, the time has come, and I've always said, if I ever run, I don't want any of the spin doctors, I don't want any of the sophisticated weaponry of the electronic media, I'm going to get up on a box in the old malls like the great orators and tell them the lie of the land of the topography the way it is because they are ready for it. People are just clamouring out there, desperate for leadership. They want someone to pick them up by the scruff of the neck and take them somewhere. And the reason we've got ourselves in this mire that we're in at the moment is directly in that lack of leadership. Have a look at the mess and the conundrum we're in now. It is just absolutely farcical. And it's reprehensible in an intelligent country like us that we have what we have. You know, it just sickens me, it does. It really does. But anyhow... That's the way to address it. And we've got to just philosophically change this mentality to welfare and distribution. You know, it's not my fault, it's someone else's fault. We've got to learn to take responsibility. Each and every one of us in this room would remember, if you failed at school, you went down a grade. Yep. We didn't compromise and change the rules. And if you couldn't get a kick in the first, or you didn't get a, throw a goal at basketball, or whatever you did, whatever your discipline was, you got dropped to the seconds. And if you didn't do your homework, you got a whack in the arse, you got the cuts. Yep, exactly. Let me tell you, I got that many beltings at school. <laughs> and even more so at home. <laughs> and you know the two most loved possessions I have? It's my family and my school teacher. They didn't do me any harm whatsoever. But the lack of respect and the lack of discipline. And this is, a, this is where it's all emanating from. We've just got to get back to reclaiming some of those values. You know, you have a look at the, line, have a look at the uh, landscape now, and I listen to, you know, preferences. You know, we've got this parasitic element, you know. Why would, we, why would we be surprised with what we've got? People said, Sam, why don't you stand? You know, why don't you run? You'd be an automatic shoe-in. 
course I'd be a shoey. I'd win tomorrow by a landslide. But you know what would happen to me? I'd be shackled by the party machinations who would have me stripped because the ones that stand and run and occupy the benches now are those nondescripts who have missed their vocation in the private sector, sit up there for three years, get a salacious wage back and ask three questions which absolutely are meaningless, which are scripted for them, and make no contribution whatsoever. But they're squeaky clean. Because you know why? Because they've done nothing. But I would get up there, I'd be exposed firstly from a three DUIs, which might have been a four in the morning, <laughs> a couple of marriages, and a couple of other brief dalliances, whatever that might be. <laughs> but that's what we do. Yeah. The ones that can make a contribution, there are so many people that have been weaned off for that very reason. You know, there are so many heavy hitters out there on both sides of politics that we've lost that should be occupying the corridors of power. But, you know, we've got this insatiable appetite. You know, whether it's a remnant of our colonialism or not, I don't know. But this tall poppy syndrome. And we've got more than just a passing interest in, you know, celebrity status. It's more than just an escapism. It's almost become, you know, we've got a manic obsession of tearing them down. You know, we need our leaders and we need our heroes. And we should, you know, nourish and develop. And if there is one message I can leave you with here today, it is that very, very fact. Well, everything you've heard thus far, I'm sure, is all relevant. But let me tell you, it's got to be underpinned by a very solid foundation. Yeah, that's right. And the solid foundation is very simple, the message I've just given you. Because the people out there, let me tell you, I'm just waiting for someone to tell you. Can you believe we haven't got a dam built? Now you all know. Can you imagine the people, the crap that they cop now and the amount of wastage that you know, our governments have uh, incurred upon us? Do you not think five or ten years ago, if someone had been smart, well Malcolm was our biggest disappointment. We gave him the biggest majority charter and did stuff all. Now, I remember talking to Bill Kelly. Now Bill Kelly's another mate, but through the AFL circles, you might wonder why I deal with all these people. <laughs> Bill Kelly said a wonderful thing. He said, you know, when he got Bob Hawke, he said, you know what, Sam? He said, we knew exactly what the, you know, Malcolm Fraser should have been a three-term Prime Minister. But he said, we knew Malcolm very well. He said, the first term, he said, don't raise the Bunsen burner on him. He said, because he's going to be a do-nothing Prime Minister. He's going to be like our, our biggest concern when Kevin Rudd got appointed. He said, he's going to be all on feasibility studies and a public service. But he said in the second term, we'll raise the, raise the, uh, the uh, bar and exactly what they did and got him out in two terms, which was faster when you consider the enormous majorities that he had. And the same concern, had the same breakfast and the same dinner with uh, Bill Kelly when Kevin Rudd was appointed. Kevin Rudd was in, not, no need to tell you, was uh, in charge of, uh, of major development in the most populous, populous government in this country, the Goss government in Brisbane. Lindsay Fox, a good mate of mine, and Bill Kelty went up to Brisbane to sort out the health issue. They were going to fund it themselves. He was going to organise a consortium. Kevin Rudd threw him out of the state. That's how smart these people are. And this is Bill Kelty telling me, not Lindsay. So he's got a vested interest in it. But all I'm saying to you, the people of Australia are clamouring for leadership. And it's not, I don't know the talent that's prevalent in this room, but I've been listening to a lot of it and I've been outside before I walked in. You know, there's an impressive list. Now, we may be small in numbers, I know uh, the opportunities. Let me tell you, this country, whilst you think I might be a bit harsh as I speak now, but this country, there's a lot of reason to be looking forward to with a great deal of optimism. There's a lot of opportunity here, it's not doom and gloom. And the political, uh, the polit the political landscape, is anyone's oyster. You know, you can make it an awful big noise, you know, if you get the right message out there. But say it as it is. Let me tell you, I do it, the commercials, and <laughs> what you see out there is exactly who I am. And remember, finally, I'm not going to bore you, Lent, because you've been sitting through a heck of a lot. But finally remembering, God we trust is not some right-wing political slogan. Christian values are the very base of our existence in this country. Both Kokoda and Gallipoli were not an aberration. Our forefathers paid the ultimate price for us to enjoy the privileges of this wonderful democracy. And those who wish to join us, we embrace with open arms.
providing they're willing to learn the language, respect our laws and respect our women. And those that don't, tap them on the shoulder and remind them to reread the Constitution. It's quite conceivable that we left out a very important chapter. And that's the one that clearly states that if you're not happy with your lot, pack up your caravan, piss off and let us enjoy our country the way we always have. <laughs> so, good luck in all your endeavours. I know there's a plethora of talent in this room and you never know. When you start uh, putting on the proper coffee and some <laughs> food, I may even lead your party one day. God bless. <laughs>